Hey, it's Alex Rauka from Board Game Co, and today I'm doing a review of Mercado de Lisboa, the new thinky filler from Vital Lacerda and Eagle Griffin Games, where it takes the core game of Lisboa, that's not true, it takes a sub-element of Lisboa and turns it into its full own developed game, a game that plays between two to four players in roughly 30 to 45 minutes, depending on, you know, your experience, game time, all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to go into how to play the game, an overview, not every little last rule, but an overview of how to play, and then I'll come right back to you with my opinions. So in Mercado de Lisboa, you're going to start by setting up these restaurants on the various tiles with a gray dot in the middle. Now, these are all going to go face down and can be claimed by the players. Now, in the game, there are two ways to play. There's a variant in which there are two options to play in terms of the money. The money can be revealed or it can be hidden behind these player screens. I generally recommend playing it with the money. I and the designer as well recommend playing it with the money hidden. But for the sake of simplicity for this, I'm just going to have it all revealed so you can see everything in the game. Now, a, t a basic turn in Mikado de Lisboa consists of doing one of four things. Either you're going to place a marketplace stall, and let's place those out first, because you're going to grab three of these marketplace stalls you're going to put them down over here for players to pick and then you're going to give three to each player as well and that's how you're going to start the game off now in the game what you're going to do is you're going to place out on your turn you're going to either place a marketplace stall or place a customer or place a restaurant or take a coin that's what you're going to do in your on your turn take a coin is pretty simple you take a coin your turns over if all players take a coin in a row the game ends that's one of the game end triggers in a two-player game if both players take a coin twice in a row then the game end triggers so that's basically the coin action you'll find yourself doing it possibly once or twice throughout the game but it's usually not the most efficient action alternatively the other actions you're going to do and i'm just going to play out a few turns playing out how a starting game might play out for those who know the strategic depth involved, please don't judge me because I'm going for speed and how to play over strategic depth. So for instance, I might go ahead and grab this stall over here and place it out. Now, every time you place out a stall, it's going to cost one coin for each stall, one coin for itself, plus one coin for the, the stalls in the row or column, whichever is greater. So when I do this, I'm going to take the restaurant I just put out, put it face up in my area. I'm going to pay one coin and put one of my buildings on it. That's my turn. I then grab another one of these, and I think I'm going to go heavy on the tomato over there. So let's see how that plays out. Meanwhile, my opponent's looking at the board, sees me going heavy on tomato, going to grab their own tomato stall and try to jump in on this tomato game to take advantage of that placement and stop me from getting too much of a tomato monopoly, and then put their own stall on that. They too will pay one coin. I forgot to put one of these out. And then, oh, so actually, they can't do that. I lied. You see, this is the problem with this. They can't do that because they would have to pay an extra coin. So this is a good opportunity to teach you what you can't do, meaning they only have one coin to start the game, and they cannot do that. So instead, understanding what I'm going for, they'll still try to do something, but I don't know what they're going to do. This is a good time to see how the game actually plays out. We will instead go ahead, and you know what? We can't get this either because he effectively blocked this. This is the tavern. It is a better marketplace. It's a better restaurant than the others. Instead, I think we'll go ahead and go in on the tea game because we're trying to figure out, you know what? We want to stop our opponent from taking this later. So we're going to go on the fish game. We're going to put that out, take this the restaurant, pay a coin, and well, not pay a coin, not take a coin, pay a coin and put our own placement marker on it and then choose one of these to take. And I think we will take the grape because there's only one grape available and go from there. Now, my opponent at this point has no money, or me, I'm both my opponent and me. They have no money, so their options are either taking a coin, placing the restaurant they just put, or placing a customer. Those are their only options effectively. And I think we'll go ahead and put the restaurant out because we know that he can't get that either. So we're going to put the restaurant out and get one coin. From there, it goes back to my turn. I too can place a restaurant out, but I'm a little wary. I really kind of want to get in on this, this monetary game. It's a little tricky over here. Hmm, let's see. Maybe we should put a restaurant out as well. I don't know. Or maybe we should try to block their strategy. You know what? We will go ahead and... We're going to go ahead and put out a restaurant as well. And we'll see how that plays out. We'll take a coin. Great. Back to you over there. Okay, I still only have one coin. I really want to get this before he does. So I think I'm just going to... I can either put out a customer or take a coin. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and put out a customer... I'm going to take this one over here 
and put out a customer. Now, when you put out a customer, what you're doing over here is you're going to look at your marketplace. So this market, this customer has tomato on it. I'm going to look at my marketplace. This has, I has one for the marketplace itself, plus one for each adjacent matching restaurant. I will take two, one plus one times the number of customers on the tile. So that's two times one. And I will take two coins, setting myself up for next turn. Great. And then I'll move this out, revealing the next customer. Now it's back to my turn. I'm still concerned about my opponent actually getting that tile. I don't see an easy way to block him, so it's going to be what it's going to be. So instead, if he's placing a restaurant there, hmm, I can try, there's not much I can do here. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to just try to get, I can't even get the fish right now because there's no fish up here, so I can't even do that. I think I'm just going to take a coin and hope to set myself for a better next turn. Now it's back to his turn, and yep, sure enough, he's going to go ahead and put this down here paying two coins because you again account you count the row or column and count the number of stalls there and that's how many coins you have to pay so the row and column are both two you have to pay the greater of those two not both so i'm going to, have to pay two coins and i will take that restaurant tile i will then also take income based on this one because whenever you place a marketplace stall if there's an already existing customer you take income so again i'll take one plus one or two times one and take two coins and then I will go ahead and I think I'm going to double down the tomato strategy. It's working well for me so far. And then lastly, we'll put out a new tile over here. And excellent. Uh, meanwhile, I'm feeling a little defeated here because unfortunately that is making it a little harder for me to do much. But what I will do is I may as well jump into the game at this point and go over here and take advantage of the fact that, you know what? Actually, I'm not, actually, I'm okay with it. You know, what? I want to get this because this is actually a good tile. So I'm going to jump in with this one, not the best option, but I'll jump in with that to get that particular restaurant tile, put out my own marker on it, and that is basically my action there. So we have a nice little two by two grid over here, back to his turn, but first I get to take a tile, and I think I'm going to diversify a bit in this game, which may or may not be the right move, I don't know. And then we're going to go back and forth, and that's basically the game. As you accelerate, I'll go ahead and just create a board game state where we have a few more options on the table. We have this over here, next to this over here, and we'll go ahead and then we'll score a three-person customer. Because one thing I didn't tell you yet is you can only put a customer down if the number of stalls in that row are equal to the number of people or greater. So I can't put a three down in this row because there's only two stalls, but I could put a three down over here. And if I did that... I would score for this row, I would score one, let me see if there's a better one, no, I'll go with this one, let's put this down here. So I would score for this stall, I, there's a matching resource, and it's one plus the tavern, which is always wild, so this is two times three, or six coins. And then for this one over here, it's again two times three for another six coins. So you can see how as the game accelerates, putting restaurants, putting marketplaces will be more expensive, but at the same time, will also reward you with far greater reward. And that is basically Mercado de Lisboa. Again, you either place a marketplace and you pay the associated costs and possibly earn income for existing customers, or you place a restaurant taking one coin when you do so, or you place a customer triggering any scoring benefits. I can't actually place that there. Or you place a restaurant, a customer taking any scoring benefits for the various stalls. And all players score, to be clear, not just myself. And lastly, you take a coin. You do that until there are four empty spaces on the board of either four empty uh, empty areas or four empty customers, at which, which point uh, the player who triggered it, every other player takes one final turn. And that is the game. Mercado de Lisboa, simple, to the point, place things down, min-max the cost versus reward, and then call it a day. And with that, let's go to my thoughts. So, that's how you play Mercado de Lisboa. That's ultimately what you're doing. You're placing tiles, figuring out the optimal strategy, optimal way to not just figure out the cheapest or most efficient tiles to place, but how to get them back, how to get back the reward, the, mon the money, to ult ultimately end the game with a score that is higher than your opponent, which is really how you win most games. So with that said, I'm going to go into my pros, my cons, what I can see others not liking, and then my final thoughts. But before before I do that, to frame my opinion so you understand where I'm coming from, I will say that my all overall opinion of Mercado de Lisboa comes down to this. I like this game. I want to see what the experience continues to deliver. Right now, I'm intrigued. I want to keep playing. I'm enjoying it. I do have questions or concerns as to the longevity of it in my, my own collection. But with that said, let's get into it. So 
To begin with my pros, the game is beautiful, and not just from an abstract, oh my gosh, this art is gorgeous, rather it is it is reserved, it is elegant, it perfectly fits the format of the game that it's going for. It's very, very to the point, very clean, delivering just enough that you really get a feel for what this game is delivering. It's no abstract art, it's, nor is it any, I don't know which game to compare it to, but Everdell or who knows what, it is well done in terms of the presentation it brings to the table. For me, I think one of the things I really enjoy about this game is the strategy and tactical placement of this game. Meaning the whole game ultimately comes down to placing things to min-max a slightly better score than your opponent. If your opponent places down a marketplace or market stall that costs them two more than is optimal and places down a customer that gives them three less than your customer, ultimately you will win on the margins. That is how you will win this game. You'll win it on the margins by being slightly more efficient than your opponent and or the tactical element of taking advantage of what your opponent does. Because throughout the game, you're going to be constantly putting out things. You're going to be constantly putting out tiles to try to build up your own segue of moves so that you can more, most efficiently score 15 coins in a single placement. But if you are paying attention to your opponent, you will not only be able to, to block them, but you might even be able to take advantage, placing your own marketplace stall in a way that forces them into the move they're making, or alternatively taking the customer on the table that is clearly perfect for them, and then placing it on the board in a way that might be suboptimal for you, but stops them from getting an 18 coin score, an 18 coin move. This game involves thinking and watching and outmaneuvering your opponent, but you have to pay attention to everything. You have to pay attention to which customers are on the table, what tiles they have in front of them, what tiles you have in front of you, what market, what 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 uh, businesses are, stores, whatever it is that they have in front of them. What every single element of the game you have to pay attention to in order to find those lines where you will be able to outmaneuver them. I really appreciate the the degree of of knowledge that goes into making that ultimate move. And I will say that I like that because only because there is not so much as to not be overwhelming. Now what I mean by that is very often in games I actually don't like it when you have to pay attention to everything. I want to I want to pay attention to my board. I want to be have a general awareness of yours but pay attention to mine and then play the game. I don't like it when games give you too much information, but in Mercado de Lisboa because of how clean the game is, because of how condensed it is, it is easy to pay attention those, to those few metrics of what is going on with your opponents in order to tactically outmaneuver them. I like the fact that the playtime in this game, the playtime to strategy reward is off the charts. In terms of the, it really does fit that category of a, a thinky filler. It is, it, I initially when I got, when I heard the term, I compared it to games like Arboretum, games that are a little heavier, yet despite that are on the lighter side. And this is not that. This is very heavy. It is very brain burnery. It's a lot of, of min-max and optimization decisions that you're going to be making in every single move of the game. The moves ultimately just come down to placing a single thing, one thing at a time. But you will find yourself staring at the board wondering, well, if I place this here, it'll cost me two and get me six. And if I place this here, it'll cost me four and get me seven. Which one is better? You're going to be constantly evaluating every single decision, which can be a con too, and we'll get to that. But there is a lot of tactical depth to the playtime, assuming you can keep that AP down, assuming you can keep that analysis paralysis in check so that you are not constantly dragging out every single turn, then you will ultimately get a 30 to 45 minute game with the depth of, well, with the depth of something a lot, a lot longer than that. I love, one other thing I love in this game before we get to my cons is I love the end game triggers and hidden money elements. Meaning, again, the hidden money is a variant, you don't have to do it that way, but for me, I can't imagine wanting to play it any other way because it is the end game triggers in this game. Uh, it, sorry, the end game triggers. The idea that you sit there and you trigger exactly when the game ends. You you could control the board to an extent and try to figure out: Do you want to accelerate end game or do you want to keep scoring? But you want to do that in check with your knowledge or belief that you are winning because. Trigger an endgame is useless if you're not winning, so you have to try to keep mental gymnastics of, well, how much money does he have? How much money does she have? Who's going to win this game if I try to trigger it right now? And there is an element of memory to that, and obviously, of having a general feel for what your opponents do. And of course, you could actually count that, and we'll get to that, to, we'll get to that in the what I can see others not liking. But for me, I really appreciate it. For me, it adds a tension to triggering an endgame. It, it feels very much like Victor Crumb and Harry Potter and Quidditch, which is a reference I don't know why I'm making. But the idea that you are in control of when the game ends, and you want to do so when it's on your turns, and unlike Victor Crumb, I guess you want to do so when you're actually winning. And with that, let's get into my cons. So 
my first con is the thing, I mean, well, really my first and only con, my first and only con for me myself, before we get into what I can see being a problem for others, is the thinkiness to pay off is is hard. I know I just said that the game has a great playtime to strategy reward, and it does, but that's playtime to strategy. My specific concern with this game is that there is a huge amount of thinkiness that goes into every single move. There's a huge amount of trying to min-max that optimization. And I don't know if the strategic payoff, that mental, the, 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 the feeling of accomplishment you get when you win, when you outmaneuver, I don't know if that reward level is there, if it has the, the right combination of the amount of thought process that goes into every single move, is that corresponding payoff there and the feeling of reward you get when you win or when you outmaneuver. I don't know. To be clear, I'm not saying it isn't. I'm saying that I've played this game three times now. And, and for the record, it's a good time to mention, I've only played it with two players so far, so take that into account, this is only a two-player review, that I've played this game three times now, and each play was incrementally better. Each play for this game was more enjoyable than the last, a little bit less thinkiness in that game, and a little bit more of a payoff in terms of my ability to get my move to the table quicker, to see those patterns, to understand what I'm doing. But... If that continues to grow, if my payoff ratio continues to grow, I can see this being a game that sticks around in my collection for a long time. But as of right now, it is a little bit more. For instance, I'll compare it to TAC. TAC is one of my favorite two-player thinky abstracts. Very much a lot of thought process goes into every single move. And yet the amount of thought process to feeling clever in that game has a much better ratio than Mercado de Lisboa. That being said, I've played TAC like... 30, 40 times, and I've played Mercado de Lisboa three times, so I'm more than happy to give it that window. But that is the only con, the only reason as of right now that I can see this leaving my collection at some foreseeable point in the future is that aspect, is that how will it play out over time? Will it improve? Will it get better and better? Or is it going to level off and be a great game, but one that might be a little bit more of a of a chore to get into compared to other games on my shelf. So that is the only real con that I personally have. As far as what I can see others not liking, it's dry. This game is dry, 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 dry. This game, if you told me this game was designed by Rainer Knizia, I would have no problem believing that. And no, that's not meant as a diss against Rainer Knizia. I have a lot of his games, enjoy a lot of his games. But my point is this is a dry, pasted on theme, abstract game where it comes down to number crunching. It comes down to math and number crunching. That is ultimately the whole game. That is, it is dry. Every single thing in this game comes down to spend three, get seven, spend two, get six, manage to put up a combo together that I spent only four and get 16. That, that's great. Lots of that going on in the game, but it's basically just dry math the whole game. Now, for me, I don't mind that. I don't mind math at all. I enjoy the process of, of trying to figure out and min-max. But if that, if that aspect of basically mathing out and planning a tactical board around the most efficient math strategy, if that doesn't sound appealing to you, this might not be a game for you. For me, totally not an issue. I enjoy that. But think through other games you like, other games you don't like for that matter, other games you've played that come down to trying to most efficiently get a few extra points on each placement. This is very much that game and that just won't be the right fit for a bunch of people. The second thing is the hidden money endgame element. And this is one that's kind of a throwaway because you have the variant where you just reveal your player screen and play with open money. But the specific point is many people understandably don't like the memory aspect that goes into games. In a game where you have perfect information, and in theory you can track everyone's information if you just take notes, if you're just like, well, plus 17, spend three, plus four, spend two. If you can keep notes and track people's elements, then why turn it into a memory game? And I completely understand and agree with that, and if that sounds like a problem for you, get rid of these player screens and play with open money. I can't tell you how that will change your experience from a experience point of view because I only played with the hidden money, but that I can see that hidden money being a problem for others because I myself am not a fan of memory games in the slightest. I do not like memory games at all. And for me, when a, when a game has a degree of scoring memory where you, you can track how many victory points, how much money they have, but you're just probably not going to because you're going to enjoy the game. That particular element doesn't bother me, but of course I can see it being a problem for others. And then the last thing is, going back to the math, I, there's a lot of easy to forget math in this game. While the gameplay rules are very, very, very simple, the gameplay rules are, there are a handful of rules in this game, 
it's very easy to play this game and consistently forget either the math involved or forget how to score or forget the sequencing that you don't just get money when you place a customer, but rather you get money also when you place a marketplace down and that will trigger existing customers. It's very easy to forget a lot of the math involved in this game, possibly because it's so simple. There are only a handful of rules and they come down to, to, to numbers, basically. They come down to, well, when you do this, it's the greater of this column or the lesser of that column. And when you place a customer, you'll get the greater of this plus that times the number of customers for each row and column. There are enough small, simple mechanics to how the game plays out that it's very easy to go through the game and forget some of those rules to play a whole game and not even realize that perhaps you you forgot a sequence of play and again i can see that being a problem for others for myself that's part of the learning experience and really nothing was particularly overwhelming but certainly it is it is simple enough to end up deceiving you because of how simple it is and that is ultimately my pros cons and what i can see others not liking as far as my final thoughts my final thoughts on my card below bow and if you've been paying attention the whole time nothing i'm saying will be a surprise I really like this game. I enjoy it, but I don't know where it will end up in my collection. It will either end up rivaling some of my favorite abstract games, games like Tsar, games like Tack, games like Yinch. It will either end up rivaling some of those games, and I think most specifically Tack. Tack is the heaviest two-player abstract I have, I believe. I could be wrong. But I think it may well end up rivaling that game in my collection if it continues to grow, if it continues to to feel more tactical and less of a chore trying to min-max each score as I get better at this game. At the same time, like I said already, I do have the concern that if it doesn't continue to grow, if it's if it's tapering off, then ultimately at a certain point I'll see myself saying, you know what, it's just not a game I'm pulling off the shelf. But for right now, I really enjoy this game. I do recommend ch checking it out. It's currently on Kickstarter. It it's a cheap enough game. Whether you get it now or you get it in retail, it is certainly cheap enough. It is one that it, it is charming, it is beautiful, there's a high level of strategy involved, and ultimately it's one that I, I think I can recommend. Until next time, I'm Alex Rackett from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this review. Have you played Lisboa before? Have you played that marketplace element? Is this nothing new to you? Are you more intrigued by it? Or have you played any Vitalis Serta game for that matter? Let me know in the comments down below because this is this is my first, I don't think I said this yet, but this is my first Vital Asserta game that I've actually played. I am very intrigued. I have some of his games on my shelf. I just haven't gotten to the table yet. I am very intrigued as to what they will offer in terms of gameplay, in terms of depth, in terms of all that. But this was certainly a great introduction to his games for me. Until next time, I'm Alex Wackler from Board Game Co. And I hope you have a good one.